I'm Command Sergeant Major James Diggs, and uh, I will talk to you briefly about some of the uh, survivability, medical response, and care overview. Next slide, please. As you can see, uh, the medical, me military medicine, our Army has played a significant role in regards to the efforts of military medicine, as cited by our Chief of Staff of the Army, General Casey, and certainly our former Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, the 31st Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General Cody, in regards to our commitment to not only support warriors, but also the family care. Next slide. This is the Medical Command's mission and areas of emphasis as aligned with our strategic themes on our balanced scorecard. As you can see on there, delivering leading edge health service and promoting optimizing outcomes for families as well as warriors. You as the community for science and certainly the technologies, you're playing a significant part with that particular piece. Next slide. This is the actual balanced scorecard like everyone that are strategic level commands in our army or in the military. Next slide. This is a snapshot, not an eye chart, to give you an appreciation for the complexity of an organization that is supporting those needs to promote survivability, not only on the battlefield, but also at the same time here in the homeland itself and some of the costs associated with it. Next slide. This is the average day in the United States Army Medical Command. This gives you appreciation for the complexity of the organization and how you, the scientists, the engineers, and certainly our own Medical Research and Material Command and other research elements and industry itself, how you're playing a part with that. Next slide. This is a depiction of the evacuation process of individuals that are going in and out of the actual theater itself. As you can see, we have approximately 42,000 soldiers uh, that have returned from the CENTCOM AOR back to the continental United States. As you can see, there is a disparity in regards to the amount of individuals that actually were returned to the fight when they actually hit Lonstool itself. In large part, I would say I can attribute that success to you and technology. I had the pleasure of being the Europe Regional Medical Command Command Sergeant Major for almost three years. So I had an opportunity not only to see our warriors returning from the fight, but other coalition partners. Next slide. This is the advancements in regards to the trauma care and survivability. As you can see, based on research and development, we've made tremendous strides from World War II to present day battle. And I would say, in large part, not only is it because of the approaches to military medicine or medicine itself, but also some of the actual pieces of equipment that you've allowed us to actually have and use based on what you have given to us in the fight and also back here in the homeland in our large medical centers that are supporting those warriors' needs back in the homeland itself. The other piece is you look at the resuscitative aspects in the fight and also here back in the homeland itself uh, those things have, have immensely changed. Been in the Army 26 plus years, and we've graduated a long ways from the days of just the stabilization, load and go, and putting a person in the back of a vehicle and getting them to the next level of care. That's due to science and technology. Next slide. As you can see, tremendous reduction in regards to our footprint and our presence on today's modern battlefield. During Desert Shield, Desert Storm, when you think in terms of the formation out there, medical side took up about 14% during Desert Shield, Desert Storm. As you can see in OEF and OIF, 3% in regards to the actual battle space itself. So not only is it a thing of the reduction of the actual elements that are there, but also, as you saw earlier, the survivability rates are much higher due to the leveraging of technology and the training that we've actually put into the hands of those warriors on the modern battlefield to actually provide medical care. Whether that's the combat medic, whether that is a Navy corpsman, or anyone that's actually providing that care to include our combat lifesavers out on the battlefield. Next slide. As you can see, we talk about our force structure. In 1988, where were you? 
Okay, many of you were not only in the system doing what you do today, providing support for our mission and helping to promote an increase in the survivability opportunities on for our warriors and our, and our family members on top of that. But as you can see, there's a tremendous reduction in regards to the amount of hospitals that we had in our inventory in 1988 before the wall dropped and what we have today. Back then, we had 49 U.S. Army hospitals. As you can see, in 2008, we have 24. 21 that are CONUS and three that are O-CONUS, in large part. It's not so much of just, quote unquote, doing more with less. It's because of, again, leveraging technology. And I can also tell you, based on the care that warriors are receiving prior to making it to those respective fixed facilities, based on med medical reengineering initiatives, that's by yourself, other research partners at Medical Research and Material Command, industry itself, and preparations at places with partnerships right here in Florida, like at the Miami Trauma Center and at our own AMED Center and School. And of course, the efforts of training and doctrine command. Next slide, please. Based on our warriors in transitions, unlike previous wars, yes, we have had severe injuries of warriors in the past, those that have served and worn our nation's claw. But if you look at the survivability and you look at the warriors that we are returning back to the fight, warriors that are in transitions, we return approximately two brigades per year back to the fighting force. 88% of those individuals range from the uh, rank, ranks of corporal through sergeant first class. That's a tremendous piece in regards to the success of keeping and sustaining our volunteer force because you cannot just automatically thrust someone out of the schoolhouse and their sergeant first class or staff sergeant or even a young sergeant for that matter. Next slide, please. As you can see here in the uh, New England uh, Journal of Medicine, uh, one of the things that's actually promoted in regards to the success of assessing and getting our arms around the mental health problem, a challenge that we have now because of some of the things that our warriors are exposed to in the fight, whether that's Afghanistan or Iraq. Uh, based on technologies, uh, we're working with some things right now uh, based on the research side and also uh, the Army and DOD have definitely made a valiant effort in regards to putting the appropriate people uh, to spearhead that effort and make it a collective effort for successes. Next slide, please. That's what the com competing demands of all of these things as you can see right there. I mean, we're, we're facing no different than anyone else that are serving in our military in regards to the challenges with Grow the Army, ACRC rebalance, and some of those other transformations and mission-oriented type things. So with technology, you can help us make it uh, to the finish line. Next slide, please. One of the pieces in regards to some of the great things that are going on beyond a bandage, beyond some type of other resuscitative measures and other treatment regimens, is some of the initiatives going on based on the brace realignment piece in San Antonio. And as you can see, the efforts that are taking place in regards to that in San Antonio itself between Brook Army Medical Center and Bamsey proper there in San Antonio. Next slide, please. As you can see, those are some of the other continuous efforts in regards to the San Antonio piece and all the elements that are involved with that BRAC initiative uh, with uh, Fort Sam proper, Wilford Hall, and also the bringing of some of the other uh, commands within our Army force structure uh, to San Antonio. Next slide. Up in the Washington, D.C. area, the National Capital Region itself, where I'm at, uh, the efforts that are going on in the National Capital Region are tremendous in regards to not only technology, but building new structure and actually redefining uh, the scope in regards to the National Capital Region with the new facility over at Beth Bethesda and also at DeWitt itself. Those particular facilities will be joint in nature in regards to the manning aspect. And as you can see, uh, many of the actual uh, pieces with that we're leveraging not only uh, technologies, but even from an institutional standpoint, because you shoes will play a significant part in also partnering with public health in regards to keeping us online with some of the medical practices as well. Next slide, please. 
This particular slide, I think, says it all in regards to survivability, and we talk about returning individuals back to the fight. Uh, the picture before you, you have this proud warrior, uh, Sergeant Major Yuri, Delta Force. Individual was severely injured, was treated at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, and, and five months after receiving care and on a recovery regiment, uh, Sergeant Major Yuri was back into the fight within the CENTCOM AOR. Uh, as you can see, the prosthetic and so forth. Uh, yes, there are warriors that are continuing to serve with those types of uh, devices uh, and doing a great job, I might add, in regards to it because of the leadership ability. It's not so much of the fact of that prosthetic. Uh, it is the experience of that warrior that we're able to sustain and keep him or her in the fight. And in large part, uh, we owe a nothing less than a simple thank you to all of you for doing what you do and continue to do each and every day to help keep our Army strong. Next slide. At this time, I will be followed by Sergeant Major Robert Moore. Thank you.